AI in Action is brought to you by Aulus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Our host brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success, and their advice. Focusing on fast-tracking you to the top, AI in Action cuts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. To listen to the latest AI in Action podcast, head over to www.aldus.com forward slash podcast, or subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Podcasts. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Andre Cohen. Andre is the head of data science for Tilting Point. Andre, welcome to the show. Hello, JP. Yes, uh, thank you for having me on. Our pleasure. Andre, let's start with uh, a little bit of background of yourself. Um, How you first got involved in technology, some of the, the roles you've held along the way, taking us up to your current position here, leading the data practice at Tilting Point. I've always been interested in, in tech from a very early age. I, I mean, I, I was raised in, with my father being a, a consultant and I always had access to computers and, and video games. And, but I never really, you know, I had different phases in life. Like I wanted to be a pilot for a minute. Um, but then in college, I gravitated towards computer science. And this was back in early 2000. And slowly migrated into a PhD in computer science where I was doing machine learning and studying. Um, ironically, uh, or coincidentally, my, my interest is, was in uh, something called reinforcement learning, where you try to learn about the environment and build a model uh, based on observation and trial and error. And my choice of work was in uh, trying to learn how to play Atari games. Uh, little did I know that I was in, like actually prepping myself to work with video games as a, as a career. If everyone, uh, everyone's listening now, uh, thinking to themselves, wow, had I just continued with Atari or PlayStation, Xbox, could have ended up running, running a data team for a gaming company. So please tell us how, how, that's, how that's come to pass. Well, you know, it, it, that was also kind of uh, by happenstance. I was, I was doing my PhD. It was the third year. I had progressively gotten more into... I had phases, right? Like as, as any computer PhD person does, maybe it's first you're really interested in theory. At some point you say, no, I want a lot of data. I want to do what Google is doing with big data. So I, I gravitated towards image processing. Um, then I got really obscure because I wanted to do something that no one else had done. And <laughs> except that when you go to very obscure, then also funding gets a lot harder. And like a lot of PhD students, I found myself one year suddenly without any kind of funding uh, for the summer. I had no, like, I couldn't teach. I couldn't, you know, work in a lab. And that's when I slightly got, it got a little bit more desperate, right? And I searched around and I found a guy in New York who had a video game and it was like 90% done. It was on the time when the iPhone came out. So this was still like the gold, gold rush of making games on for the iPhone. It was literally like if you had a game that had more than an intro screen, you, you most likely would be making a couple thousand dollars uh, a month. So, so that's what I did. I developed this game. I finished it essentially like what had already been started. And that was a fun way to pay for the summer. Uh, but that lesson like really taught me, you know, that I should learn how to get my own money. You know, if I want to do a career in, in teaching and work in a lab, really what I'm set, setting myself up for is to be an entrepreneur of a kind. And somehow I have to learn how to get my own funding. And there was really no way to do that in a, in a school environment, right? No professor says to you, son, let me teach you how to get funding. <laughs> Come with me. Uh, so, uh, so I gave up. I, I, I reached out again to this guy that was making a video game. He was also very uh, un- unhappy with his real day- daytime job. And so we both quit. I quit uh, the, my PhD halfway through. He quit his job. And we decided to make a video game together. And that's how I've, my career deviated from the, the normal path, if you will. Brave decision. I, I mean, I'm sure many people listening will have had that feeling, but never actually quite uh, took the the leap so uh, before moving on to any other roles it'd be great to just talk about how you weighed up the pros and cons of that decision and ultimately what tipped you towards uh going for it uh, mid phd 
I eased into it, to be honest. And the way I eased into it was that I said, oh, you know, I'm going to take a sabbatical for a year. I think my school will allow it to me to take a single course every semester, and I'll just take that one course uh, via distance, and I'll be enrolled, which will give me access to health insurance, because it's hard to, <laughs> if you're starting a new company, it's hard to get health insurance uh, for yourself. So I got the university insurance, um, and I did that for two years, actually. For two years, I took one course every semester. I got one credit. It was like I, I spoke to my advisor at the time. He understood the, the need for me to, you know, venture out and explore with always like the door being open if I ever wanted to come back to my PhD. And that, that saved the beginning. Uh, it was only after the second year of doing this that I had to make the real commitment to say, okay, maybe I can still get into this PhD program if I want to. But for now, there's, that, let's not kid around. I have to get my own health insurance and, and, and move on from school. Okay. So what was next then? So was this... Is this what led you to 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 watch you or from are we talking about uh, gondola no so that was white shoe white shoe media it was it was the attempt you know uh, of a lawyer who ex lawyer who nicholas who who created the company white shoe media We're like kind of symbolically for you know white shoe uh, law firms um and yeah, we were making games. Uh, we sat together, we decided to make a game from scratch. I had ironically had in my lab uh, during my PhD set outside a class for two semesters where they taught game theory <laughs> while I worked. So I was like, I've learned all about how to make a game because I, I sat outside of a PhD game theory class. Um, so I took all of that knowledge and, and I started applying to making a game. Um, and I was everything. I was the the, the guy making the, the game engine, the thing that runs the game. I was also, you know, talking to the graphic artist to design the, the graphics so that it would work. I was making the website for the company, everything. And that was a, a good learning experience because I wore every hat I think that a game company wears or a person would wear in a game company. Uh, and it was a learning experience because within a span of a year, we, we did the whole process and we launched a game. And we like every most games in, in the mobile space, uh, they don't work out. <laughs> so we, we had that experience as well of, you know, wait, taking a whole year and figuring out, OK, we have to move on to the next game or figure something else out, which, which is what we did. Um, the, the company lasted about a year longer and then we moved on. But still a great, a great transition, which has obviously continued the path leading you to, to, to where you are now. So you, you spent then almost six and a half years with Gondola as the co-founder and CTO before taking your, your current position at Tilting Point. So it'd be great to understand how, how that transition happened and, and then leading us up to, to your current role now. Gondola happened by chance. I don't know what... Maybe it's like when two creative people sit together, uh, they come up with really crazy, ambitious ideas. But when the game we launched didn't work out, and it's pretty obvious because you look at the numbers, you see the, you know, the, the trajectory pretty quickly. Um, you know, we knew we had a problem when on a weekend, someone spent $50 at once in our game and we were celebrating on the weekend. Oh, wow, our game has finally found, you know, players that like it and they're spending <laughs> money in it. The following Wednesday, you know, my, my business partner was talking to his mother and she's like, oh, I loved your game. I spent $50 this weekend, right? And it completely destroyed us. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it wasn't even a, a real player. After that experience, we started to think, okay, can we, can we savage the game? And that's when Gondola came up. For some reason, uh, when we were developing the game, we had this idea that was pretty novel at the time of let's record everything the player does in the game. Like there's not a single touch on the screen that isn't recorded. And also let's make the game fully configurable uh, from afar so that we don't have to make a new version of the game in order to make a change to the game. We, we did that and we started playing around, you know, with things, what can we change in the game that has a profound impact for the player? 
And what we realized is one of the easiest things that we could do is change the price of the items in the game. It's one of the few uh, industries, if, if the only industry, where everything in the game is virtual. So if you're selling coins in the game, I'd, it doesn't matter if the coin, you know, 100 coins cost a dollar or they cost five dollars. It's arbitrary. And the same thing, you know, it doesn't matter if, if you're selling, you know, the car upgrade for 200 coins or 50 coins. It's not like it's a, it's a valuable or a scarce item. So we got really into that. Um, and Gondola was a, a, a journey where I think I went from game designer and game developer all the way to what I do now, which is data science. That brings us to tilting point. So look, anyone in the, in the online gaming industry will, will be familiar with the brand, but for, for non-gaming folks listening, could you give us a, a, a high level overview of who are tilting points? What makes us different is that we have a progressive way of working with developers. Just like we discovered at, at White Shoe Media that making a game is very risky, um, the, so does every publisher know that. And one way to reduce the risk is to have a progressive way of getting to know a developer better over time. So our bread and butter is you know, helping developers who are small and don't have perhaps the, the budget or the team size to run marketing and user acquisition for games. Uh, we, we partner with these games and we provide everything we can in order to boost the, the, the visibility of their game and the reachability. So we grow the audience and, and that is the, the model. Um, but as we work with these games, we, we get to learn about the developer, the, 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 the people, and from there we start working more together. So we just released the game now where it was actually a developer that we had started working earlier with just in doing the, you know, helping them with user acquisition. Uh, now that we knew them, we pitched for a new game with them and now we've co-developed the game. So there's a 50-50 stake in this game now. And, and then you can see like o o over time, you know, you, you do more and more with the, the developer and eventually the, the dream is to eventually absorb the developer and bring them in-house so that we make our own games from scratch from the beginning to end. That's amazing. So again, there's a lot we can learn from you um, on, on the workings of the, the online gaming world, particularly app development. So could you give us some insight and, and set the stage for what happens behind the scenes and how important the, the analytics and, and metrics uh, are in assessing whether a game is going to be successful and then talk about the impact Tilting Point has had in helping app developers be successful. You know, data is, is pretty much everywhere in a game. Uh, just like, you know, in the White Shoe Media days where we did basic analytics, um, that is, that's the bread and butter of every single game you can play on the App Store. Uh, you don't have to worry. Uh, everything you do in a game is recorded um, and analyzed. Um, and it's not just there, right? It's uh, user acquisition is also fully, fully recorded, right? We know everything about the bids and the targeting of the audience for an uh, uh, ad campaign. And on the flip side, we also know when the player comes into a game, we know where they come from. There is attribution service providers that tell us the, the source of those players. Then within the game, we, we have complete visibility on what they're buying and what they're playing and how much you're consuming of the, the currencies inside the game because it's a virtual economy and everything in it is regulated and measured. And then finally, there's all the tools outside of, of the, the core game that we also measure and, and monitor, such as you know, push notifications and email campaigns. We have data from you know, Facebook, Discord, you, know, you, you name it, YouTube, uh, and we are looking at how players engage with the community. So it's a fully data-driven business. The story really is that the, the companies are often divided into two parts. Um, there's definitely the creative side, the people that make the games and, and they're looking at the mechanics of the game. So they're interested in the, what we call like the core game loop. So it's the process of you know, earning coins, spending coins, uh, some amount of delay so that you don't get fatigued. So the, there's like artificial timers in the game to make you come back after an hour um, and so on. And there's also concepts of, you know, there's, there's a part of the game that is free 
that at some point you have to create some amount of pressure uh, to convince a player to convert and pay. Uh, that's one side of the company. And then the other side of the company is uh, a mixture of data science and like standard uh, industry things from other companies too, like user acquisition is a huge portion of our company. Um, and then the other part is you can't advertise it if you don't have artists in house to ad create the ads. And just managing the, the creative workflow is, is, a, is a whole company in itself. Yeah, it's, it's clearly a lot goes in that, that the general user would not be aware of. Um, so focusing now on, on the impact that Tilting Point can have to a, an app developer, could you, is there any story or example that you could show us or talk us through that would demonstrate uh, just how big an impact it can have in the success or, or lack of success in a, in a new app launching? So the success is, I think, can be measured in two different ways. Um, we can measure the success in the form of some of the knowledge that we have that we share with developers. Um, so one of the cases is a game that we were working on uh, called Languinis. And in that game, which we since acquired fully, uh, and we work fully in-house with it, um, just the knowledge of the data science team and the knowledge of the product team with like best practices, we doubled essentially the, the revenue in the game um, just by applying what we knew, right? The other one is more, more subtle, but I think it's one that's really scarce in the gaming industry is if you want to advertise, uh, you, need a, you need a budget. Um, and even big players in the game industry have this problem that even if your game is very successful and you, you, you realize that let's say a player on average spends $5 in their lifetime, I'm just picking very low numbers though, because in gaming things are really different uh, from reality. Uh, but so the average player spends $5 and you realize that you can acquire these players for $4. That means that you always make them $1 out of every player that you acquire or you do an acquisition for on Facebook or any other ad network. That means that at this point, it is strictly a cash flow problem of how much money can you spend in UA way uh, before you exhaust your bank account. And because it takes some time to get the lifetime value of that player, right, to materialize. So it might be two or three months down the road that you get that $5. So you have to just have a, the bank big enough to, to afford this. And this is partially tilting points also value proposition is yes. the fact that the, the amount of money that we have uh, saved to, to do these kinds of things is, is almost limitless. It's a matter of just having enough games that can exhaust it. And so that's what we've been doing a lot is funding these games and funding games that have a longer, you know, time to, to materialize the revenue. So Amazing. 60 days is, is, a, is not unheard of for us. Wow. What a turnaround. Uh, I think this is, this is important information for the overall gaming community to be aware of because it really can be the make or break of a, of a development firm um, is cash flow. Focusing then on the data science behind what you guys do, obviously your role, head of data science, um, could you give us some insight to what, what's involved in, in, in the data science side of running the business, what you and your team are working on and some of the interesting problems you're solving? My, my preparation entering this was, is, is very abnormal and not, not the typical thing that happened. So the, the reason I am at Tilting Point, right, is because Gondola, my, company, my previous company, got acquired. In, in the Gondola days, I, again, I, was, I had the fortunate position to do everything related to data science. And, and that was fine. I, I, I always enjoyed it. But it, when I entered Tilting Point, uh, the data science uh, actually became more interesting because what it means really changes based on the size of the company uh, and where the company is at, right? If you look at Uber data science, uh, you know, there is, you know, that, that means something very specific. Like that means that you have a PhD, uh, you're working in models of how to make, you know, burritos be delivered it was using Uber Eats as fast as possible while, you know, I don't know, minimizing gas consumption and red lights plus uh, driver fatigue. I don't know, but that, that's like what it means, right? Uh, for, for tilting point though, data science is, 
is really an all-encompassing process. My role, for instance, is you know from is anything that relates to data uh, that is partially my interest in my domain. The data science, the tilting point, if you like, what are we doing? Is is a combination of an immense amount of data gathering that to power all the tools that we have. Because one of the things that makes publishing really hard for data science is the fact that every single game is different. Uh, we have zero synergy between the things we work on. But as a company, we have a huge amount of uh, value in normalizing it and generating data that compares all our games in our portfolio at the same time. That's the, the huge pain in the butt though. So every month we get two or three games added to a portfolio that are up completely different in, in the data that they provide. And so part of data science and the data engineering team that is within the data science group is about ingesting that data. How do you get the data from obscure Korean ad networks uh, that we've never heard of? Um, how do you deal with ad campaigns being generated uh, by team members that are not in our company that have different naming conventions than our own? So that's, that's part of the process. The other part of the process that is in data science also includes the, the business intelligence and analytics, right? Because this data is not easily accessible. Uh, there is an intermediary step of someone that generates reports um, on a monthly basis to, to explain to the rest of the company how the company is doing. So that's also part of data science. And obviously there is like the stereotypical data science, which is tools that we build on top of data. Tools that include things like price optimization. So figuring out what is the best price for a given player based on their activity. LTV projections are super important for us. So lifetime value projections, because knowing uh, how much a player will spend on average in their lifetime is the determining factor on how much we can spend in user acquisition and how, what kinds of games we can work with, right? If we overshoot it, there's significant impact financially in the company. So it's almost like the, that, that is the secret sauce that differentiates maybe some publishers from others. I think that's great to understand what happens in, in in the metric side of it and how data science just keeps its finger on the pulse of, of everything that's moving um, in order to, to predict levels of success. Um, what do you see as the natural evolution um, for the industry uh, taking into account where we're at currently and with the advancement of cell phones and 5G? What are the next big changes that we can anticipate? The, the concept of data science in, in gaming company is something that kind of happened organically and the title was added much later after it really already existed because when a game is made, it's being made by developers and they understand by just who they are, especially in gaming, um, there's a, this urge to be the cutting edge of technology every time you make a game. So by definition, games end up having a lot of data science and a lot of data science people even before you have a data science team. And that's actually the, the thing I think that's slowly changing is separating those two out. Data science and where it's going and the advancements I think is in the synergy between the data. Um, when, when I started six years ago, it was already, you know, the big achievement was to have real time analytics. The, the concept that you could in real time know what every player in your game was doing. And the myth was, you know, we could react in real time. Oh no, this player is about to leave the game forever. Let's, let's do something about it, right? We've evolved. Real-time analytics is not as important as we thought. What, what really, I think the lesson there is, I no longer care about how real-time analytics is done. There are third parties providers for the service. It does not require a seven person team to develop real-time analytics, for instance. And the same thing happens everywhere, right? I think early on in mobiles, in the mobile world, there was this uh, push notification was a thing uh, where Apple announced it and, and then Android also had push notifications and slowly people started building their in-house push notification services to communicate with their player base. As time went on, third-party services came up that do all of the push notifications for us. So we no longer have to do that. And the same thing is happening everywhere, uh, where we have, think that we have to build something in-house, and later we learned that 
there is an easier, faster way and cheaper way of doing it using a third party tool. And so the, I think what leaves you know, data science in, in the future and right now is letting go of a lot of things and in turn focusing on how to combine this data together. Considering that we know everything about a player before they ever enter the game because of the targeting and user acquisition, because we know everything they do within the game. And then we also know everything afterwards about how they left, why they left, and et cetera. The great power is in combining all of this data into one single uh, player journey and mapping that out, you know, what is the flow? And just to add like one element that is especially interesting for publishers is we have multiple games and each one has multiple player journeys, if you will, of this like beginning to end uh, data about what everything that happened for that player. And the question that right now I'm looking into for Tilting Point is what can that inform us about future games we work on or want to build? You know, we, we obviously know things about uh, match three games and we certainly know things about cooking games, uh, Star Trek based games. Um, we know things about player behaviors. We know how hard it is to find those players. We know what it takes to keep them in, engaged in the game. And so the, the, the future for data science and gaming is really trying to figure out, okay, now that we have all this internal data, how do we build better games? How do we build games and niches that we already understand something about? And, and that is really the, the focus now is trying to harness all of this data to that, for that purpose. Andre, thank you so much for this. This has been a great learning experience to, to look behind the scenes of what happens in online gaming, um, the metrics behind it, the data science that's driving it all, and to hear about what the, the coming changes we can expect over time. It's great to see how big an impact Tilting Point are having, and, and we look forward to, to seeing you guys continue to succeed. Thank you very much for today. Oh, thank you. It's great chatting. AI in Action is brought to you by Aulus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Aulus offer an exec search program. Aulus can help you discover how data science and AI can transform your company. With our unrivaled network of C-suite executives and senior AI professionals, we offer retained search services across the US and Europe. For more information, contact mark at aldus.com. Get the Aulus advantage. Become a member of the Aulus community and enjoy some of the following. AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston, and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to all us members. And don't forget our AI in Action podcast. Each week, we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career, and more. Become an Aldus member and get the Aldus advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldus.com. Dot com. That's www.aldus.com. Aldus International, empowering through AI.